What's up everybody? It's your boy Beam here. I've got my advent calendar still in frame. Typically it's been sort of hidden right here uh, under my main monitor, sort of above my keyboard on my desk. But, um, you know, we're having it in frame today. <laughs> Bang! Uh, today is the 7th of December. Here we go. Whoa. It's a, like a Santa hat, like a Christmas hat. You can see it. Um, yeah. Check that out. Isn't that crazy? They've really got the critter on the Leo the Pio channel. No way they have the critter. Um, for breakfast, I didn't have anything. For lunch, I had quinoa salad and like five donuts. Um, I'll elaborate on that. And for dinner, I had pizza and that was very tasty. I woke up this morning at 4, about 4.52. Um, I've had it so then my light automatically turns on whenever my alarm goes off. And it's sort of horrifying in the moment, but, um, you know, in about 10 minutes I, I really, really uh, am happy about it. Because I'm already brushing my teeth, uh, and about 10 minutes after I've been waking up is when I normally wake up. And I'm already brushing my teeth by then, so that just goes to show how much time I'm saving. Uh, and yeah, I had a couple cans of coffee, a couple cans of coffee in my backpack for school, and I headed off. Um, I, you know, I don't know, I showed up. Um, I had my English class, I got my paper back. I, on a rough draft, I got a, on my rough draft, I got an 80%. So I'm pretty happy about that. Um, yeah, I need to turn in my final draft. It's not one of those where if you're just happy with an 80%, you can keep it that way. You've got to turn in a final draft or else it's like kind of a zero. Um, no, it's 25% off your, because the two essays, each essay is 50% of your grade and each draft of, so it's rough draft is 25%, final draft is 25%. For the two essays, it's, that goes up to 250% and that goes up to 100%. So it's, the final draft is 25% of my grade, so I can't not turn it in. But, I got an 80% and I'm pretty good. Um, I got some compliments on some sentences of mine. Um, I also got quite a bit of criticism, which is normal. <laughs> you know, that's, that's why you take an English class, to get criticism on your, on your writing. Um, but, you know, it, it was really good. Um, I wish we wrote a little more in the class. Um, if my professor didn't get sick, we would have been writing three essays instead of two. But, um, honestly, like, <sighs> sorry, um, honestly, I don't know. I wish I wrote a million essays. I don't know. When it comes to the quality of my writing, I do feel like I write some pretty good sentences sometimes if I think about them, uh, with the, uh, sentences that I, that my professor commented on. Um, I remember thinking about them quite a bit as I was writing them and sort of being like, man, this is a banger after I wrote it, you know? Um, which, you know, is, is immediately visible when you read the sentence, right? But, um, um, I feel like, especially in 11th grade, I, I'd say, like, as of this point in my life, I can imagine my writing will probably get better. Um, I just really like writing about things and I'll probably keep writing. Um, I hope, fingers crossed. If I don't, that's fine. But, you know, I, I, I'd feel uncomfortable if I don't write things right now, um, just outside of school time. So I, I feel like, you know, writing things is important. Uh, what, I, 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 as of this point in my life, I feel like that my writing was at its best probably in 11th grade. Um, we were reading a lot of Howard Zinn in history class. And uh, Howard Zinn, very good writer. Um, it's just I, I took a lot of inspiration from his work just in the structure of his of his stuff and I got very I don't know if my teacher was just just thought I was goaded or something but I got very 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 positive comments on my writing it was sort of 
it was kind of a staunch, like, I don't know, like, I, I, from my, from my perspective, I feel like my, the quality of my writing hasn't really changed too much since, like, 10th grade, but, I don't know, F judging by comments from teachers, the writing of my quality has been crazy at 11th grade, or maybe it's gotten the same at 11th grade, and at 11th grade, I was writing at a freshman college level, um, so a 100% rough draft in 11th grade would be an 80% rough draft freshman college English 101. Um, but here's the thing. I was doing some of the easiest English assignments of my life in senior year, and uh, if I just took one test, uh, that would count as my English 101 credit, credit. Even though the work we're doing now in English 101 is way harder than the stuff I was doing in senior year. Well, not harder, but like, the, 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 the literature we're reading is way more dense and uh, interesting, I guess, um, uh, than, like, it's just some stupid fiction. I'm not, I don't want to write about fiction. Sorry. Um, anyway, uh, well, I say I don't want to write about fiction with my entire last essay for English 101 that I got my final, my, my criticism from today was about a fictional movie, but I'm, you know, I'm applying non-fiction concepts to a fictional movie, for the record. I'm not just writing like a function, like a functional book report, you know, um, uh, in, like, in comparison to what I was doing in senior year. Uh, but I do feel like maybe the reason why that would have counted as an English credit if I just took a test is because, um, <sighs> I don't know, like maybe a normal English 101 class, you would just be doing book reports. And I feel like that would suck. I'm good at writing book reports, you know, I'm, it's, I, you know, I have no complaints, you know, but um, the, the current English class we have right now is just really phenomenal. The cu current English class I have right now is really phenomenal and I really enjoy it. We're not writing book reports all the time. We're primarily just talking in class and that's, you know, that's always incredible. Um, anyway, so, yeah, he also brought in donuts. Um, I stayed in class like 20 minutes after class ended, and we just sort of talked for a little bit with a couple other students, and that was interesting. We talked about Rachel Maddow's most recent book, um, which, you know, uh, I'm, I'm kind of indifferent about Rachel Maddow. I've actually watched a lot of Rachel Maddow's show, which is, I've probably watched more than anyone in that class, most likely. Um, but that's just because my parents have it on MSNBC whenever we're having dinner, and we just happen to be playing Rachel Maddow's recorded episodes that we recorded during dinner. You know, I, I watched a lot of Rachel Maddow, right? Um, but, you know, we were talking about how, uh, you know, uh, uh, we're gonna get political. Um, Donald Trump with his sort of, uh, grip, grip on power, historically. Uh, it was a little bit fascistic, right? Um, and we were talking about how, you know, particularly when you look at Rachel Maddow's most recent book, it's called Prequel, I think, uh, which is a pretty funny name. I, you know, it makes sense why she called it that. But, um, you know, you look at uh, the rise of uh, fascist leaders in the U.S. and uh, not in the U.S., just generally. You look at the rise of fascist leaders and, you know, there are some really interesting similarities. Um, and that sort of maps on to a, to, uh, the work of art in the age of mechanical reproduction by Walter Benjamin, uh, cause he talks about sort of the dichotomy of the, the cameraman and the artist and how, um, typically, you know, the artist is sort of, um, there's sort of a power structure against the artist in society, like the archetype of the starving artist, you know, um, there's sort of a power structure of society being better than the artist and that the artist, like society just doesn't get it, man just so happens that Hitler was literally an artist, uh, so this maps on pretty well, but the artist could just be someone with a vision of the world uh, that could be represented through art or it could just be re represented through speeches. Say Hitler wasn't an artist, you know, uh, he was certainly um, a fervent orator. Um, so let's say that that dichotomy of the artist down here in society uh, was flipped, right? Um, and that, you know, someone with a sort of inherent, um, from their perspective, sort of artistic view of the world, just someone who has a vision, um, when you flip it around uh, in the way that it shouldn't be with society, that leads uh, to a, a pretty uh, fascistic sort of, it's, you know, it's apparent, right? 
Um, so that's kind of what Benin talks about, and he says that in comparison to the cameraman. Of course, the most recent uh, stage of mechanical reproduction at the time was film. Uh, it's still too early to say, but I would probably say AI-generated artwork is probably um, our generation's film, uh, most likely. Uh, just like how uh, Beninin talked about how before film there was uh, lithography, I think he describes. Um, either that or... I, I'm i not exactly sure what lithography is. I, isn't it like the printing press? I'm not going to look it up. I You know, I'm wrong. You know, look it up, see if I'm wrong, right? Um, but Beninin talks about the stuff before film, which is the most recent, and now film has been around for a long time. Directors have died, their aura is static. It's, you know, film is evidently a, a very worldly art form, you know, worthy of, of consideration, right? But, you know, when someone looks at a, you know, um, the, the, the comparison to the cameraman, the Beninin's comparison from uh, the artist to the cameraman is sort of talking about how um, the artist, conceptually, this is my wording, sort of has a lot of baggage with it. Uh, art has been around forever. Um, since, you know, in Benin's terms, since uh, the prehistoric man had been uh, drawing elk on the cave wall, right? Um, maybe not elk. I don't know exactly what he described. Uh, some sort of creature on the cave wall. Um, you know, art's always been around, but the camera, very new, and it sort of presents a very, uh, in a literal sense, objective sense of reality. Um, you know, no matter what you do with a camera, it's kind of, it's a little bit different with phones and, you know, again, with AI, right? Um, but, you know, with a camera, you see a kind of objective sense of the world. No matter what lens you use, you still see the same basic objects, right? Um, you know, you take a photo of my room with any camera, it'll look like my room, no matter what. You know, you look at the room as if you're seeing it through your own eyes. And in this scenario, you know, the lens of the camera, you know, is, um, sort of transports the eye of the viewer to the area that you're taking a photo with, you know, to, to the area that you're taking a photo in, right? Um, so the comparison between the artist and the cameraman, I keep starting a sentence with that and then not describing the dichotomy, but... Um, the comparison between the artist and the cameraman is that the artist has a lot of baggage and this concept of like a societal flip um, uh, that can lead to like uh, fascistic sort of uh, 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 fascistic sort of society. Uh, but then you look at the cameraman and that presents a very objective view, uh, view of reality and how, you know, um, it's kind of difficult for things to be subjective when you're taking a photo of literal objects in the literal world and it just replicates objects on a, on a page or a... Uh, um, <laughs> Just a big page with a with a printing. There's a weird sound outside. So that was pretty interesting. The reason why I talked with him for so long is because I was asking about Walter Benny's comparison between the artist and the cameraman, and I've been listening to an audio book of the an audio book of the work, um, which is a little silly. I should be reading it and taking notes. He's using words with odd definitions and. Yeah, you know what? I, I should just be able to look them up as I read, but I'm listening to it and it just sort of goes past at the same rate and I can't, you know, I can't track my eyes on it like I'm like I'm hunting for prey, right? Um, but, you know, what can you do? Anyway, uh, then I... Yeah, so we brought in donuts for the whole class and uh, because I was the only student left, he handed me the, he, he handed me the donuts because I assume he didn't want to be walking around with a box of donuts, so... Um, uh, teacher to student, uh, he gave, you know, uh, this box of donuts to me. So here I am walking around with a box of donuts. I'm like, man, should I just, should I litter? <laughs> you know? Um, well, you know, I feel like now maybe this is just me. Maybe I'm immoral or unethical, but if I have a rather inconvenient piece of trash, like a big box of donuts with a bunch of happy eaten donuts and like two whole donuts in it, I'm like, man, you know, Maybe, you know, maybe the negative effect on the world from littering is lower than the negative effect on my life by carrying around this box. You know, I, I, you know, I do that, I do that mental comparison in my head, but, you know, then I think about people seeing me litter. That's not a great reason to not litter. <laughs> but I'm, anyway, I'm going to stop about, I'm, I'm going to stop talking about, um, the ethical quandaries of, of littering, but, um, 
Long story short, I don't litter. Um, next thing I know, I'm sitting on this table in another building and on campus, you know, with this box of donuts on the table and I'm working on my laptop. And, uh, you know, I I have like three donuts in class because, I, you know, it was evident that nobody was gonna eat, like all the donuts weren't gonna be eaten. So I had to eat some, right? And I have weird brain worms around wasting food. I tend to way overeat sometimes uh, because I'm really worried about wasting food. Uh, you know, you look at my videos from four years ago and you see how overweight I was and it's because of stuff like that, right? Um, luckily, you know, I ate a little less. Uh, I asked my mom to stop buying so much food and stop cooking so much food, make smaller portion sizes uh, because it became sort of a cycle where I would eat all the food and so my mom would keep producing the same portion sizes and then I would eat all that food and it, it was like weird brain worms. Um, but, you know, I'm good now. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just yapping. Sorry, guys. Um, anyway, uh, so I had like a few donuts and I'm sitting here with this box of donuts on the table and I just have the worst stomach ache imaginable. I don't have stomach aches, so maybe this is a normal stomach ache um, and I'm just not used to them. So it felt horrible, but I was really going through it and I was texting my buddies. You know, I turned off my phone after English class because I really wanted to get work done, but I could not get work done in this horrible, painful state I was in. So I, uh, you know, I brought up Instagram on my laptop, which, you know, you're really desperate. Um, and I'm like, guys, I'm, I'm fighting for my life right now. <laughs> my stomach really hurts. And uh, I'm just texting my buddies. I'm waiting for my stomach to stop hurting. Eventually it stops hurting and I'm able to do my math final. I got an 87% on it. Um, and right now I have a 92% in the class. So that might create my, that might either bring my grade up or my grade down. I guess we'll see. Um, but, you know, I did not have business class today, so I just sort of sat around. Um, and then I had math class, and this math class was the last math class I'll ever have. Ever. It's, it's the last math class, assuming I don't do any more additional schooling, which I might. But if not, this is the, wow. Today, December 7th of 2023, is the last math class I will ever have in my life. That's crazy. Um, I, I guess I never thought of that. Was, the, today was the day of the last math class I'll ever have. My knowledge of mathematics will only go down from here, I assume. Which sucks. Maybe I should just, like, try to learn math, like, on my own. Maybe I should just, like... That's really weird. Um, yeah, it was the last math class and probably the last math class of my life. So um, I, you know, I shook hands with my professor, uh, but that was at the very end of class before then. Um, what we had to do a quiz. Um, I'm part of this sort of program where there are two teachers in the classroom instead of one. I just did it because it was the only class available for that, for it, you know, the class with this program. Um, and it's useful, you know, I mean, it, good to have two teachers, you know, two is better than one, um, but um, it results in the federal government uh, thinking you're a stupid person. So we all had to take a quiz at the end of the class where it shows you like a big red stop sign that says do not enter and it's multiple choice on the side it says what does this sign mean and then you check uh, to not enter, right, you check that box uh, and then you press submit and then it's a big green check and it's like you got it right and I'm like wow, thanks, I know how to read big red signs. <laughs> you know, like, wow, I can drive, you know, you know, ironically, I don't have a driver's license, but if I see a big, uh, you know, uh, octagon that says stop, um, I, I think I know what, what to do there. <laughs> um, stop signs look like that in Europe? No, right? Wait. European stop sign. Let's see. Okay, I'm looking around. I think they might actually look like that in Europe. The font might be a little different, but they're, you know, they're certainly white and red octagons. Oh, some of them are circular with like a little upside down triangle. Is that German? Oh, it's... It's Turkish. Durr. I haven't made my... This is kind of unusual of me. I haven't made my thumbnail yet, so maybe I'll put that in there. Probably not. Maybe. Maybe I will. It might be funny to put dur in my thumbnail. That's a Turkish stop sign. Oh no, I looked up 
European stop sign, and there's a sign that said dir, and it said turkey under it, so I assume it's Turkish, but maybe it's talking about the animal. <laughs> um, anyway, um, yeah, so what else? There are these weird little hard plastic rubber ducks on the table, and I asked the teacher, well, my, my professor, Something nice about college is you can call your teachers your professors and it sounds fancier and you sound smarter and more intelligent. Um, so my my professor um, said, uh, I asked him why there are all these tiny little, that's what these are, all these tiny little rubber ducks on the table. And he pointed to these weird security camera looking things on the ceiling and he said, oh, this is actually the testing room for some, some like, Sorry. Um, this is actually the testing room for, for some program, and the rubber ducks are actually to calibrate these cameras, so then they're pointing in the right places, so then there aren't any blind spots for checking for cheating, you know, after the fact. And I was like, oh, okay. And he said, I actually have no idea. I'm pulling your leg. Uh, those cameras are probably for hybrid classes. I, I have no idea why there are rubber duckies there. Um, and so I was like, well, since they're there for no reason, you know, there's a lot of thing in my head, I'll just take one. I'm doing so- I'm thinking about doing so many crimes today in this video. Sorry guys. Um, but yeah, I told- I totally actually did commit the crime and I- I stole them. But there were two- like, it was a tiny little rubber duck on a desk. In front of me. It was where I was doing the test. Would ask me what a stop sign was, you know? Um, or do not enter sign. You may- you know, maybe I can't read it, judging by my ability to recall, but anyway. Um, No, that was it. I walked home. Uh, well, I, <laughs> I didn't walk home from school. I, you know, I took the train and then I took the bus and then I walked home from there. Um, and I don't know, that went, that went well, I guess. Uh, yeah. All right. See you, dude. Is that it? They went home and my parents, turns out they ordered pizza. Goodbye.